Hi, I'm your host, Rida, and tonight I'm really very proud to have with me a Lebanese person who is from a third generation Lebanese person and definitely who has done and done a big job on the social media platforms. We're really proud of him because uh, tonight I would like to highlight the life of such a young person who have made it big time on the social media, as I said. Today I have with me William Rossi, or as we know in Lebanon, it's William Rossi. <laughs> William, <laughs> hello and good evening, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well, how are you? I'm doing fine. I'm doing fine and I'm happy that I have met you lately, uh, actually by by coincidence through social media. And I have seen how how the impact that you have done in such a short period and that you really have achieved a big number of followers in a very short time within something with something which is really very simple, but something that really doesn't come to mind always. And uh, I want to, to, at the beginning, to introduce people to William, uh, William Rossi. Mm. So I guess a little brief about me. I am I am Lebanese, I am, but I am born in Canada, in Montreal. So I I don't speak Arabic yet. That's my <laughs> one of my goals for 2023. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I'm. Please I'll teach you. It, please, <laughs> I, please, I I need the help. <laughs> but uh, yeah, basically, I, I'm 23. I am the founder of a brand called Sprout. The goal of that brand is to explore what it takes to live a more meaningful life. Mm -hmm. And that is based on kind of my path as a young adult trying to figure out what he wants to do and who he is and how he makes sense of his place in this world. And understanding that the lessons I got from being on this journey, you know, that a lot of other people my age feel that way and people older than me even feel that way. Um, so my brand is based on helping people develop the mindset to go out into the world and do what you want. Have you ever wondered what the regrets of some of the oldest yet wisest people in the world are? Or maybe some pieces of life advice that they would give to someone of your age? In this video, I'm gonna be interviewing retired seniors in their 60s, 70s, and 80s about their best pieces of life advice and their deepest regrets. Here's what it feels like. You look the same looking out, but people see you entirely differently. And in today's world, they look at you like you're worthless. You feel like you played tackle football the day before. Just can't remember why you feel so sore. And you're up and you're doing things and you're just really sore. And then uh, you go into the bathroom and you go like this. Because all of a sudden there's this old face in front of you. And you go, holy shit, I'm old, I forgot. I played hockey until a couple of years ago. I quit at the 84. I take no medication. I don't remember when I've had a headache. feel good. How old are you? 73. Can you describe to me what it feels like to be 73? <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Depends what, what life you had before. How was your life? It was absolutely great. I was born in France, came to Canada when I was very young. What is a big mistake that you've made or a big regret that you have that you learned a valuable lesson from? I got married when I was very young. Like, I don't know how old you are, but I have grandchildren that are in their 30s. So I would probably have lived life a little bit more than getting married then. How old were you when you got married? 18. What age would you get married at, let's say today? Probably in my 30s. And that really shows in your videos because when we see such a such a such a short interview which is done in a very professional way on video on on Instagram or on TikTok, we see that there's a person who is who looks much more mature than a 23rd year 23rd year old uh, person. So definitely, this shows that you are working on yourself when you are looking at, at people's experiences when you're checking what they're doing you are reflecting this on yourself and as if it's you're building up more and more experience every day i just want to know also how did you start because you had you had your your degree in finance right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes i was in finance yes in, in mcgill in, in 2020 <laughs> uh -huh. yeah, yeah so basically <laughs> i gr i graduated from mcgill in 2020 yeah. Uh, with a finance degree and I had no previous knowledge of how to edit a video, how to film a video. Like I never owned a, a, a professional camera. Yeah. And all I knew is that like, so from the start of my university career, basically I was someone who wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I didn't know what that looked like and how I was going to achieve that. Yeah. And when I got into university and I've always been someone who I like to be at the top, like I like to thrive and, and figure out how I can get there. Yeah. So when I got to university, I asked around, like, who are the cool kids? Who are the, you know, who are the people everyone looks up to? And from my, from my whole life before that, those people, like when you define cool, you define it on personality. And 
usually those people are nice to hang out with. They're cool. They're helpful. But here, everything was about career, at least in the business school. So the cool kids were the people making the most money, working the most prestigious jobs. And it was like, if you wanted to be cool, you have to do that. And I, I, again, like I didn't really know who I, who I was or what I wanted exactly. So I was very susceptible to influence. And I ended up going from someone who really wants to be an entrepreneur. And I had previously worked in a bank like the summer before going into university and I hated it. So I was already, I was already someone who hated that life, but I didn't know what I wanted. And by the end of that year, I had, I had been in another bank job. Like I got so influenced that I actually applied to another job and, and did my CV and it's a long story, but basically I was very pressured into doing a career I didn't want to do by my school peers, you know, external pressures that become internal pressures. And I got to the point that after 10 months, I received a, a job offer that was worth six figures or more than six figures. And it was basically when you graduate, this is, you know, we want to sign you. We want you to work here. Yeah. And so I had to make a decision that said, okay, either I say yes to this and I start my life doing something I know I'm not going to love, but which was, that is which was in a banking, which was in a bit banking uh, company. It was in a big bank as a financial analyst on the trading floor. Okay. Uh, And so either I start my my life doing that, you know, something I'm not passionate about, but, but that is acceptable. Like no one will tell me that it's not acceptable. They'll be proud of me or I do something else. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I do something else and I guarantee it'll be more passionate. I'll be more passionate about it than, than the bank job. So I'm like, because I had been working on myself for five years, I was able to say no to that job offer. And so then I said, okay, finally, I'm going to be an entrepreneur and I'm going to decide what I want to do. And whenever you start a business, the best business you want to start is based on a problem and the best problems to solve are problems that personally impact you. Yeah. And so I was thinking like, what problem, you know, is my life is there, is what problem exists around my life? And it was the fact that I said no to my job offer, but all of my friends who hated the job as much as me said, yes. Mm-hmm. So why did I say yes? Uh, so why did I say no? And they all said yes. And that was because of my mindset. I had just been working on myself. Yeah. And so once I graduated, I said, I'm going to make a brand that inspires people to do or to build the mindset to follow their dreams, however that looks. And that's kind of how it started. And that's very nice. Exactly. So <laughs> because because you were able to achieve your dream and your goal in a way that mm-hmm. that took you in a, in a completely different, uh, different way than the, the way you started in studying and as the way you started as, as in, in working also in the working field. But now I want to talk about this system, creating an, mm-hmm. a whole agency with some people to help you and working on and helping people in creating content, which is very difficult. Copywriting is very mm-hmm. difficult. Creating content uh, content is really very difficult because even we know in the movies and everything, the script and everything that's written is the hardest thing ever. So how come you went this way? <laughs> <laughs> well, I started, I always liked writing because I used to, oh, I still do, but I've been journaling for six years. So every day I, I, I take 20 minutes to journal and it's, it's a big mm-hmm. habit that I put a, put a lot of importance on. Okay. But that made me a better writer. So I wanted to start a blog and I wanted to start writing. And I didn't enjoy the process of doing that consistently because it was too much work, honestly. Not that I don't like to work, but it was too much work and I didn't see the the result from it. So then I started the podcast, which was just audio really. It was no no video, just audio. And I didn't I liked it, but I didn't think I was ready for it. And then my friends are like, you should try YouTube because you know, YouTube is fun. Like you make a video, you can actually personally connect with people. It's, it's more personal. And I was very introverted at the time, but the whole point of my brand is to get out of your comfort zone and like, and do what you want. Right. So, um, I use my brand as a way to make myself better. And I said, okay, let's try YouTube. Let's see. And that's, that's, that is essentially how I be like, how I started making content. And so YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, like all of that. I would say it's it's the same process. It, it was just a trickle down effect. Exactly. Of trying new things. Exactly. So you started on TikTok, right? Because TikTok is basically now when you when you put the the social media platforms in in uh, if you want to put them in in, in importance uh, or in mm-hmm. numbers, 
you would say that number one is TikTok, the other second one is, is Instagram, and then afterwards it's YouTube, and then at the end is uh, it's Facebook. So how did you go this way, and especially that you had to go in a certain way that attracts people also and attracts uh, viewers? Mm -hmm. Are you saying uh, is that how I prioritize it, or are you yes. saying in general? Yeah, I, my priority has always been YouTube, actually. So I make. On YouTube, I've been making long form videos, like not the interviews, but longer videos for about two and a half years. And YouTube is, in my opinion, it's the most professional social media platform. Like there's where the most money is made, brands treat it to be the most important and has the highest growth opportunities. So I would rank it YouTube, like clear cut number one, and then a long, large space. And then I would say Instagram and TikTok and then Facebook. Um, so my priority is always YouTube. Like anytime I want to do something and I want it to be good, it's YouTube. And I really, I do, I do make interview short interviews, right? But uh, my priority is long form content and more documentary style content because mm -hmm. I believe that has the most value. And I personally don't enjoy the fact that our attention spans are getting so so short. Like I don't want. I, I you have to tap into it, right? It helps, and at least I try to provide something valuable, but. Uh, I like watching documentaries and I like watching TV shows because you have time to digest and get to know people and, and build a story. Whereas in a minute, it's very hard to actually do that. Um, so that's it's always been my priority to do YouTube. And I think Instagram is a great platform to build a community. And then TikTok, like it just, I don't know, you know, well, people started me, dancing on it and that's it <laughs> for me too this is these are the same priorities for me too especially especially youtube and then afterwards instagram and then back back way uh behind is, is tiktok for me for me tiktok i don't i don't go into tiktok but i know that unfortunately this this time everybody's going to tiktok everybody's watching tiktok nothing they're just watching tiktok especially me coming from a long long uh, career of, of television work of media I've always worked on a longer content. I've never worked on mm -hmm. such a short content like the TikTok uh, content, which is 30, 60 seconds, whatever. So it was really very hard for you even to move on from the from the videos that you started on YouTube, which were how long before? Anywhere between seven and 17 minutes, I would say. It doesn't matter how rich you are, what you look like, or where you live. One thing that all of us are fighting from the day that we're born is time. The thing is, each of us has the same 24 hours to make the most of each day, but some of us may end up having more days than others. Now, a few months ago, a stranger that I met on the street gave me one of the most powerful pieces of life advice I've ever heard. Keep in mind that the days are long, but the years are short. That sent me down a rabbit hole to find out how to live the longest, happiest, and healthiest life. And I eventually stumbled upon a concept called the Blue Zone. Now, a Blue Zone is a region of the world where people live longer than anyone else. And there are only five of them in the world. I come from a family who prioritized working over anything else and paid the consequences for it. And that's always made living and understanding how to live longer and happier and better priority in my life. Are there people who really hold secrets to living a long life? And if so, can we unlock those secrets? This is supposedly an island with the highest life expectancy in the world. So I didn't expect somewhere where people are supposedly healthy and happy and living for a long time to feel dirty. In Japan, all of these, all of these crosswalks, like all of this paint would be filled in perfectly, like to the T. It's a little bit dirty like that. There's just a lack of maintenance. Out of the 47 prefectures in Japan, Okinawa is actually the poorest one. And citizens here basically rely on tourism just to survive. Oddly enough though, it's Monday morning and as we're walking through the main city's biggest street, we see that most places aren't even open. Well, most places except for this one shop. Oh, sure. <laughs> this is such a kind serving. Mm, but question. What is the key to happiness? 
笑顔だね。笑顔だね。笑顔だね。笑顔だね。ありがとうございます。ありがとうね。わあわあ。どうぞいます。Now, even though neither Will or I speak Japanese, our goal is to find out about the secrets to longevity mainly by interacting and befriending locals. Making new friends. So we came here because we know that Okinawa has one of the highest life expectancies in the world. Yeah, in the world? In the world. Do you know why? They have good foods and they work a lot. People are so friendly, good communication. Are people not like that in mainland Japan? No. So they're not as friendly and welcoming? No. With all this talk about the impacts of diet on longevity, we're heading to Okinawa's largest food market to see what and how the locals eat. Okay, so right now we're in a fish market where the downstairs level is literally just like pure fish market, raw ingredients and everything. And up top is a food hall. And apparently you can pick your raw ingredients from the bottom and have them cooked upstairs. I don't know what's good and what's not good. It's just let's go purely based on what it looks like. Can you cook upstairs? Yeah? Okay. What is uh, yabai? Which one yabai? Yabai. Oh, yabai. Oh, yabai. Okinawa wagyu, ne? Mm hmm. Oh. <laughs> so there's 47 prefectures in Japan. Okinawa is one of the poorer of those 47. And supposedly, the reason for that is because they focus on living more than they focus on making money. And if you know a lot about Japanese culture, people specifically, those in Tokyo, work themselves to the grave every single day of the week. And it's a very unhealthy relationship that they have between career and life. But apparently here it's the opposite. Uh, at, the, at the beginning, it was a lot of, it was a mix of travel content mm -hmm. and self-improvement. I was trying to figure out my voice. Now it is, it is very well defined. It is self-improvement uh, documentary style. I still make them. I still do make the long form videos. I make them and I make short form make them at the same time yeah and you focus you focus you don't focus your work only in canada where you are born and you've always lived here you like to travel around so as to experience more the living living abroad also and meeting new people abroad yeah like the goal i think the goal in life i mean the goal for my brand is to explore what it means to live a more fulfilling life and travel is a big component of that i'm sure yeah. i'm sure you can attest to it um so it's like there are things in the world in parts of the world that so my audience is mainly north american just just like for reference but i i like to be a, someone who has a north american background and the, that way of thinking and i like to go to different parts of the world and learn about some new topic that's related to being a better version of yourself and bring that bring my opinion onto that and bring that back to that audience so i do travel around the world to make these videos for sure so you started you've started your uh, your travel in northern america you've you've traveled all over canada you went to the us and then you moved to europe or because now you are in in asia <laughs> i i've gone completely across canada i did that during covid because we couldn't we couldn't go anywhere if i've been to places yeah i went from newfoundland uh to vancouver island in like a three-month trip all the way across okay beautiful trip beautiful uh -huh. trip and uh <laughs> Then I went to the U.S. I mean, the U.S. is fine. There's, there was no particular uh, series of trips, but it's right next to us, so we can go there whenever. Exactly. I traveled uh, around Europe alone for about a month in the summer, and then now I'm in I'm in Japan and Asia for the next uh, three months. So you've been you've been in Tokyo, and now now you're in uh, in South Korea. Exactly. So I've been in different parts of Japan, maybe about 15 cities in the first month. Uh -huh. I'm in South Korea then Singapore, Thailand, uh, back to Japan, Philippines, and then back home to Canada. It's a four month trip? Four months. Mm -hmm. Are you just gonna go like, say hi to North uh, North Korea or no? <laughs> <laughs> it's funny or because that, there's- you rather come back safely to us? Oh, there's a tour that actually like brings you to the DMZ, the demilitarized zone. And apparently part of that tour is you can actually walk into North Korea in, in like, obviously if you're in a secured, uh, secured, uh, like, I think it's a safeguarded home or, or building, but I told my parents about it and, and I, they bit my head off. So yeah, I'm not going to do that. I don't think it's worth it. <laughs> like this is just to add it to my country list. <laughs> So you'd rather stay stay, stay in South uh, South Korea and then move on to to the to, uh, to other parts of Asia. Yeah, 
I don't see the, I, I don't know if they have too many. I hear North Korean food is good, but I, I, I also know there are North Korean restaurants in South <laughs> Korea. So I'm going to keep my, my safety yeah. and then eat my food. <laughs> and, and then keep, keep, your, keep your, your parents, uh, uh, in, uh, man, your parents' mind in a safe place because otherwise they will go crazy if you, if you, if you, if you they know or not you were going to, to North, uh, North Korea. I'm sure, I'm sure you would feel the same way, but my mom is always worrying, right? So, of course. Um, a healthy worry, but I would not want to do that to them. <laughs> exactly, exactly, definitely, definitely. Sitting around and chatting in the middle of the day. How old are you? I'm 74 years old. Did you grow up in Okinawa? Yeah, Okinawa. What is life like here? If you can describe it to someone who's never been. People are friendly. Friendly. Yeah. Is this a Moai? Or no? Is a group of friends or no? A Moai is a group of five friends who basically meet for a common purpose to gossip, experience life, and share advice. It's a part of Okinawan culture that Blue Zone researchers claim is a key source for their longevity. And in fact, these people are usually paired together at younger ages, just like these guys. How long have you known each other for? 50 years. 50 years. Mm. Wow. And what do you guys do? To you just hang out? No, nothing. <laughs> nothing? You just sit here and talk every week, every day? No, well, once a month. People live a long time here. Mm. Do you know why? They don't know. You don't know? Mm. You just live long? <laughs> You're just happy? Are you happy? Yeah, happy. Very happy? Mm -hmm. As we explore more of Okinawa, the thought of this place being where people live the longest worldwide is a bit shocking. Yes, the weather is gorgeous year round, and yes, there's not much going on here, but I've traveled to lots of places around the world that I could say the same thing for. It's clear that Naha, the main city here, is not going to help us unlock the secrets to longevity. We need to go deeper. And luckily, we've only just scratched Okinawa's surface. So this is the entrance to the American village. I don't know what's in there, but I assume it's going to be extremely un-Japanese. The American village was built by Americans for Americans to bring a sense of home back to troop station overseas. And it serves thousands of Americans whose bases are located just on the outskirts of this village. Now, Americans' presence in Okinawa is a fiery global topic. So naturally, I have to know more. Where are you guys from? I'm um, originally from Arkansas. Born and raised in Venezuela. Uh, Inglewood, California. You live here? Uh, yes, I'm in the military. I'll be here for two more years. You guys live here? I'm stationed here, yes. I live here, yes. What is life like here for you? Uh, peaceful. It is what you make it. For me, I love it. You know, there's some people that stay in the barracks all day and they just stay inside, don't get any sunshine, and they say that they hate it here. You know, with me, I go scuba diving, I'm scuba certified. If you're an outdoors type of person, Okinawa's for you. It's a great place to raise your kids. As a single person, it's a different story. <laughs> I don't want to be here. Do you feel like you're at home here? No, it's totally different from where I'm from. Yeah, and maybe and different here. from Arkansas. Yeah. How is life different in Japan versus in the U.S.? So definitely cultures, values, being respected even for going in an establishment and them saying like thank you for your service of you just like coming here and like choosing our store to buy from you know in America a lot of people they don't want to be at their job you know they have no kind of ethic like work ethic and out here there's just very hard workers that are very happy to do what they're doing every day but I definitely say like it's super safe you know where I'm from in Los Angeles you don't just leave your car doors unlocked but out here you'll be all right if you leave your car doors unlocked people really just have have a different trust here. And how, how do you come with the content saying every time, you, mostly you have sometimes very common topics that you go around, which is the, the age, the experiences, the things that you've learned, the, the things that you'd like mm -hmm. to, to teach other people. So how, how do you come with the content and how does it go over all the way with the, with the interviews that you are doing while you're, uh, you're uh, doing videos over on the streets? Uh, so it actually works pr pretty well together. I found a good mix. So basically, I usually, at, at the beginning, when I first started posting the interviews, it was like I had a series of questions. I would pull someone on the street and I'd be like, hey, do you have maybe th three minutes that I can just ask you a bunch of questions? Then exactly. I'd ask them all the same questions. So I'd ask the same, I'd ask a different person the same questions. What is something that we tend to put a lot of priority on when we're younger? but that as we get older, we realize isn't that important. I yeah. would say keeping up appearances. You don't really care the older you get. I would say money and career when you're young. And I think as you get older, it's more about experiences. A lot of younger people are really focused on making money and getting rich. But how do you come to that realization at a younger age so that you can be happier and more fulfilled? The ugly truth is 
Everyone needs some money and everyone wants a nice lifestyle, like going on vacation, so you have got to prioritise careers and making sure you earn enough to satisfy what you want to do. Rating yourself against others, rather than rating yourself as you believe you should be rated, mm. right? Yeah. And being yourself. The first half of your life you spend accumulating things, the other half you can't even give it away. So materialism basically? Completely. As the saying goes, when you're on your deathbed, nobody says, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. <laughs> What did you do for a living? I started off in sales, worked up my, my way up to be a CEO of a major company. What was that company, that if you don't mind me asking? I was CEO, of general manager of TOW Credit Data, which is now known as Experian. <laughs> and then I became president of Comdata Corporation. Did you enjoy and those jobs? I loved them, yeah because we were able to achieve a lot. But because I had an objective in life. Everyone always says, find a job that you love. But what is and it I about that job that you uh, love? Just interacting with people. When I was young, I thought a salesman was a person who went and knocked on doors and sold clothes brushes and that sort of thing. But when I got into sales, I was selling adding machines and accounting machines. And I was 19 years old. I was going through college myself, putting myself through college. And I just met some lovely people. I think you won is in a job for three years, you want to make sure that you're looking out. You should never stay in the same job for more than three years. How come? Well, you just get become just, stale. You're spoiling yourself by doing that. Now, limits you might have. Try and see the world through other people's eyes. We don't all have the same opportunities, and it's up to us to make sure that others have the same opportunities we do. Every day you got to grow, and every day you got to learn something. Yeah. You can't just lie in bed and eat cookies. You have to <laughs> get up and get going. You don't know it all. For sure you don't know it all, so don't think you do. And you never Keep will. Keep on learning. Learn from somebody every day. Don't take out more than you put in. Probably try and do the best thing you can by yourself. And then when you know and love yourself, you can actually give a little bit more to other people. Never do anything that might cause remorse, because remorse is something that you cannot repair. Turn a cheek. If someone comes at you or yells at you or insults you, look the other way. Don't worry about what people think. Don't worry about the feedback you're getting. I mean, take the feedback because that helps you refine what you're working on and it can be useful, but just stop worrying so much and just do something interesting and yeah. that's it. Don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. Just be a good person. If you're a good person, somehow everything works out to be good. <laughs> you, Why everyone? <laughs> Drops it, drops it out. If you like this video, then you're definitely gonna like this video right here. And if you haven't already subscribed, please make sure to do so. Thank you for watching. I'm Will, and as always, it's a mindset. But eventually, I mean, it gets it gets a bit boring for the viewer and also for me to keep asking the same thing. Like we realize people are the same at a certain point. Exactly. Um, so now what what I do is I I make my long form video. So I script that. That's the first thing I do. Once I have that topic in mind, I have interviews that are always part of that video. So then I make different questions for that and different about different topics. And then that's how I conduct my interview when I find someone on the street. So it's always like with the goal in mind of helping the long video, but then using that as short content that I can then post on various different platforms. So it's a more sustainable approach that I can uh, take one piece of content and I can apply it to a lot of different platforms. Exactly, exactly. And and just you would go around and ask people because some people they do not like why to, to be interviewed or to be to be asked any question and sometimes sometimes they do not like to say their their age also uh, <laughs> in public also as well, especially ladies. But uh, also how do you feel also there is the, the, the feedback from the persons that you are doing in the interviews with and how do you feel that you can take from them and also and ask another question also and keep going on with the conversation, a very short conversation. Mm. I I think one of my biggest strengths is I'm very good at reading people and, and mm. I have been for a long time, um, which I didn't realize was going to be a strength. Like uh, it only came to me as I was I started interviewing people. But the first two questions I ask are very it, it brings you to a different place. So like, how old are you? It's, it's OK, right? But it, you know, some people are uncomfortable with it. And then what does it feel like to be your age? Yes. So even if I post a video where I don't include, like you'll never see that those two questions, I always start the interview off with that. doesn't matter what I'm talking about. And then I can go into a topic about personal finance or sustainability or whatever. But that takes someone from laughing, uncomfortable, unsure to in their feelings and deep and uh, once I have that that environment, then I can ask whatever I want.
気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気持ちは困難です。気
of your Lebanese Lebanese uh, heritage also. And definitely, I'm always seeking success stories in Northern America. And definitely, you're a, you're a, you're a real success story who is very, very young and who really made it in such a, at some, such a young age. So I'm really very happy to be with you today, especially that you also come from a success story, which is your family as well. Your family mm -hmm. is, is Rossi, who uh, who own a certain a big a big enterprise, right? <laughs> yeah, they did. They uh, they started Dollarama. I don't know mm -hmm. if anybody knows that. <laughs> Every, everybody knows that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that's your parents are a, are a success story by themselves, and and you did not rely on the success of your parents so as to be able to create your own success, which is really, you, this is something really we're very proud of, and definitely your parents are very proud of this because you did not rely on their success to be able to live your life. You you want you wanted to make your own uh, your own uh, success by and you by your by yourself and you were able to do this and really pave the way to something which is very very important and definitely which makes any young person feel proud that he is 23 and he's seeing someone who made it at 23. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the biggest thing for my parents and my grandparents that I learned is anytime someone would talk to me about them, they would say that they really were a positive impact in their life. So my parents are amazing. They never influenced me to go any certain way in life, but yeah. I've learned from them that when you make a difference in other people's lives, it makes everyone's life better. Exactly. So I just tried to find my own spin on that. Exactly, exactly. Definitely, definitely. We are proud of you as parents and definitely their, your parents must be proud of you as well. Thank you so much and uh, now have a safe, uh, now it's your, your day. Have a, have a great day today. Good morning. Good <laughs> in, in, uh, in South Korea now. Enjoy your trip and we'll see you soon. <laughs> Hopefully I will get to meet you soon in Montreal when you're back in Montreal in three months or something. Mm -hmm. Three months, okay. a little, okay. little bit less. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll, we'll see you. We'll see you soon. Maybe we'll bump into you on the streets and you'll get to ask me my age. <laughs> I'll be in a yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> we will. We will for sure be bumping into each other. Bumping in. Bumping, bumping <laughs> in, but pure coincidence. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. It was not planned. <laughs> definitely, definitely, definitely. So, so happy to see you and best of luck. Enjoy your trip. Take care of yourself and stay safe. Thank you so much. Okay, Shalom. don't, don't go around to North Korea or to China or anywhere dangerous. <laughs> Stay safe. Singapore, come Singapore. Back, <laughs> come, back, come back to us and hopefully we'll get to see you soon uh, in, in Montreal and hopefully we'll go all together to Lebanon. Inshallah, Ya Rab. Oh, okay. Inshallah. Okay. Yeah, this, this is our yeah, goal. This is our biggest goal. Oh, it's going to happen. As it's long gonna as happen. you want to come, it'll, then Definitely. you're welcome to come. <laughs> definitely, definitely you have to go because we always go there to Lebanon it's a beautiful country and definitely Lebanon is always proud of the of the big talents and the big uh, uh, minds that they have really in, in uh, the human resources that they have and who always excel outside Lebanon hopefully they will be able to come back to Lebanon and excel there as well I was so happy to have you tonight uh, with me the young entrepreneur the young person who really made it uh, William Rossi who has High, a very high number of uh, followers on YouTube, on TikTok, on Instagram, and on Facebook. And definitely, so as to see this uh, this interview and other interviews, I invite you to subscribe to readamarzoub.com and I will see you in another interview. <laughs> Ciao. Subscribe. <laughs> Amazing.